Greetings once again and welcome. I may be, it may, I will take that one again. Greetings once again and welcome. It may be a good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you, depending on where you are on the four corners of the world. It's me again, Professor Godwell Namo, your course director, wishing you well as you view and listen to this recording. Today we are on module one for course one, and this module deals with climate change drivers and historical development of climate and carbon markets. Remember course one focuses on climate and carbon market readiness. So far you have or should have gone through the recorded overall course overview. Right. The presentation is going to be as follows. Module learning outcomes and skills gained, module objectives and topics, glossary of terms and concepts associated with the climate and carbon markets, climate change drivers, trends, and mitigation, uh, mitigation of carbon emissions. We are going to look at the UNFCCC and carbon markets. We are going to look at the Kyoto Protocol and the carbon markets. We are going to look at the greenhouse gas protocol and emission scopes. We are also going to look at the challenges associated with the Kyoto Protocol's clean development mechanism. We will also look at the voluntary compliance carbon markets, and there will be a module completion quiz at the end of the module. It will be uploaded on the platform. In terms of the learning outcomes, skills, and objectives and topics, uh, we, by the end of this module, participants will be able to grasp key terminology in the climate and carbon market spaces of engagement, historically understand the linkages between the development of global climate and carbon markets with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, realize and differentiate between regulatory and voluntary climate and carbon markets. And of course, the objectives of the module are as follows to have participants appreciate the need for carbon markets through understanding trends and drivers of carbon emissions, to provide an historical background in the development of global climate and carbon markets with a main focus on the UNFCCC and the Kyoto Protocol, to provide insights into regulatory and volatile climate and carbon markets. The topics include giving you a glossary of terms and concept climate change drivers, trends, and mitigation carbon emissions, the UNFCCC and the carbon market, greenhouse gas protocol and emission scopes, the Kyoto protocol and the carbon market, challenges associated with the Kyoto protocol and the CDM mechanism, which is clean development mechanism, voluntary compliance carbon market. Let's move on to section one on the glossary of terms. As I indicated earlier on, there are many terminologies. We just picked some that we thought were of interest, but uh, you can follow the links there and you see that there are so many others that are there. I will quickly run down through some of these, starting with the greenhouse gases. These are atmospheric gases responsible for causing global warming and climate change. And the major greenhouse gases that we know are carbon dioxide, methane and nitrogen oxide. There are also others that are less prevalent and you can read them uh, in the literature, but also very powerful and they include things like hydrofluorocarbons and also sulfur hexafluoride. Global warming potential. This is an index representing the combined effect of the differing uh, times greenhouse gases remain in the atmosphere and their alternative or in their relative effectiveness in absorbing outgoing infrared radiation from the sun. Mitigation in the context of climate change is a human intervention to reduce the sources or enhance the sinks of greenhouse gases. Examples including using fossil fuels more efficiently for industrial processes or electricity generation switching to solar energy, uh, doing wind power, improving the insulation of buildings, and expanding forest and other things to remove greater amounts of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. <clears throat> All these activities 
fall under mitigation. I know there also is around use of electric vehicles. They are also part of this. Monitoring, reporting, and verification is a process or concept that potentially supports greater transparency in climate change regimes. What about carbon markets? We've been talking about carbon markets. Carbon market is a popular but misleading term at times for trading systems through which countries may buy or sell units of greenhouse gas emissions in an effort to meet their national limits or emissions. So this was done under the Kyoto Protocol. And of course, it's also coming under the Paris Agreement. Carbon sequestration is the process of removing carbon from the atmosphere and depositing it in a reservoir. And I think one of the common sequestration platforms is our forest. A sink is any process activity or mechanism which removes a greenhouse gas, an aerosol or a precursor of a greenhouse gas from the atmosphere. We can also include the forest and other vegetations can be considered a sink. There is also what we call a carbon compliance market or compliance carbon market. Uh, in, other, in the literature, we might also get it as the uh, uh, mandatory market where uh, uh, these are governed by national, re regional, and provincial laws, and they force or compel emission sources to meet legally mandated greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets. So we find this in the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, uh, there were actually compliance markets set in there. A designated national authority basically is an office or ministry, ministry or any other official entity appointed by the party to the Kyoto Protocol. Remember, we are now uh, looking at the Kyoto Protocol as a historical or in retrospective, because now we've got new mechanisms. Of course, we know that some of the mechanisms or projects are going to be transferred to under the Paris uh, mechanism. A designated national uh, authority help desk is a support initiative for designated national authorities that provides advice, support, and assistance with submissions of proposals for standardized baselines, the recommendations of micro scale renewable energy technologies for uh, automatic additionality or grid emission factors. You can read more on this uh, on your own. We also have what is called LULUF uh, land use, uh, land use change and forestry. It's a greenhouse gas inventory sector that covers emissions and removals of greenhouse gases resulting from direct human induced land use, land use change, and forestry activities. Things like your agriculture, things like maybe wildfires, things like clearing for urban settlements, all these issues are coming here. A leakage. This is when a reduction in emissions from a carbon offset project in one location uh, produces a rise in emissions in another area. For example, when preserving a forest in one region transfers logging activities to another area of forest, or when a multinational corporation uh, shifts factories from developed countries to developing countries to escape restrictions on emissions. We call this rest to the bottom if you're an economist. Then there's what we call red, it's just an abbreviation there, reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. Then, of course, NDCs, nationally determined contributions, these come under Article 4, Paragraph 2 of the Barrier Agreement, where each party shall prepare, communicate, and maintain successive nationally determined contributions that it intends to achieve. So parties under Barrier Agreement shall pursue domestic mitigation measures with the aim of uh, achieving the objectives of the of such parties. Registries, registry systems, you can read that on your own. <clears throat> also another issue on blue carbon, which is the carbon absorbed and deposited in biomass and sediments by living organisms in coastal uh, uh, and marine environments. So you're talking there about mangroves, salt marshes and sea grasses and the, and the role that they are playing in actually uh, uh, absorbing uh, uh, carbon emissions. Then the cap and trade is a regulatory procedure that puts a cap on an amount of greenhouse gas emissions that companies are permitted to emit. And I think you can read this further on your own. But systems like the California cap and trade systems, you can look at that. 
Then we also have got carbon broker. This typically, if you are familiar with an insurance broker or any other broker, these are middlemen who do not hold offsets or carbon credits, but enable transactions between project developers and end users, um, merchants and other retailers. There's a concept of a carbon budget, which is the maximum amount of carbon. Oh, yeah, we wrote a CO2 carbon dioxide that the world can release while still having a good probability of keeping warming below two degrees Celsius a goal laid in the Paris Agreement. And of course, this buzzword that is growing net zero, a condition in which greenhouse gases emitted into the atmosphere are balanced by the amount of greenhouse gases being removed from the atmosphere. So there are also at times can be referred to as carbon neutrality. There is a route offset certificates, which is paper license provided in exchange for the purchase of carbon credits. Offset certificates should include a serial number unique to the offset, total tonnage uh, bought, the verifier's name and signature, project location, very critical, owner's name and address and other uh, vintage date. Verification is an authorized third party auditor that conducts an impartial review of the carbon offset project design and baseline calculations prior to the start of the project activity. Let me move on to an interesting area now on the, um, what we call carbon readiness. Now, when I talk about carbon trade and readiness pillars for Africa, it is important for the participants to know that you can just jump into the carbon market without putting in place some of the precursors that are needed for it to be successful. And as such, um, I'm moving clockwise uh, from, from, the, from the 12 o'clock position. On I, we need to talk about the ICT, um, uh, information communi communication technologies and digital platforms, uh, technology platforms. You need to have this um, in, a, in a working condition and uh, you need to have this ready. But also the institutions, their capacity uh, for early engagement need to be ready as well. So we cannot engage then in the carbon markets readiness uh, talk without having our institutions ready. Apart from institutions, we also talk about uh, individual capacity. The, as the officers themselves from government and other actors, are we are familiar with the terrain that you are talking about? We need to be ready there. We also need high level political and management buy-ins in terms of the carbon trade readiness. And I think that is uh, self-explanatory. Without our, uh, our superiors buying into it, whether they are political or management, then the whole venture will fall flat. There also is about, around education, awareness, and networking that are needed. Then, of course, there's policies and regulatory frameworks that are needed and finance. And what is also interesting, there are also other makers there that, that might come in on the readiness, which are called means of implementation. Things like the technology, things like the finance, things like education and awareness capacity, uh, uh, capacity building, they can also be collectively uh, referred as finance, uh, uh, means of implementation. Finance, technology, and, and education awareness, critical. Let me move to section two that's going to look at climate change drivers, trends, and mitigating carbon emissions. There's a small activity there that actually there you are going to be meeting several such activities, small uh, YouTube clips that we insert in here at the times we might even insert uh, long um, uh, uh, webinars that we thought would be important for those that really need to go into depth. We also provide that as a resource. So in this uh, activity, you might want to listen at this Climate Change 2021, the physical science basis to 10 take you 10 minutes. Climate Change 2022, Impact Adaptation and Vulnerability it can take you 14 minutes. IPCC 6th Assessment Report, Climate Change 22, Mitigation of Climate Change uh, trailer. It will take you only three minutes. Then we've got Climate Change 2022, Mitigation of Climate Change. Uh, it will take you 13 minutes. Remember talking about drivers. It's important. So we have actually inserted very latest information from reputable global bodies. This is the United Nations Framework Convention. No, this, this is the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, latest publications, uh, uh, ARA reports that uh, you need to familiarize with.
Now, there are also this, all these issues that when I talk about climate change, I spoke about the IPCC reports. We, I spoke about COP26. We also talk about even the war that is taking place between Ukraine and Russia. We talk about the SDGs, talk about the net zero emissions. All these issues are important for us to look at. Now, why do we talk about climate change, uh, climate, why climate compliance? I put here a graph that is talking about maybe the green innovation wave. You discover that uh, in the first wave, uh, we are talking about the iron, the iron age, water power mechanism, textiles, and, and other things. We move to the second wave. We're talking about the steam power, rail, steel, cotton. Then we move to the third wave, which may probably was one of the most, ch most challenging in terms of the climate issues that we're having today. We discovered electricity, chemicals, internal combustion engine. That internal combustion engine is one of the key drivers of where we are today. We move to petrochemicals, electronics, aviation, space, etc., digital networks, biotechnology, software, information technology. And now we're also even talking about the uh, sustainability, radical resource productivity, green chemistry, renewable energy, green nanotechnology, the sixth wave. We have also even introduced electric vehicles, hydrogen vehicles, they are coming. So these are some of the issues and the developments that you might want to just have at the back of your mind when you're talking about climate and carbon markets. Like I said, we take the, the third wave when the combustion engine was introduced. Now, when you talk about climate change, you're likely to meet two definitions. Uh, one for, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, which says climate change, CC, refers to any change in climate over time whether due to natural variability or as a result of human activity. Another definition is from the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, which says climate change refers to a change of climate that is attributed directly or indirectly to human activities that alters the composition of the global atmosphere and that is in addition to natural climate variability observed over a compared period of time. So what you discover here, the UNFCCC definition is aiding us as human beings as one of the key challenges in the system. So we demand food, we demand uh, productivity, we demand industrialization, and all these activities lead to the emissions of harmful uh, uh, greenhouse gases. Now, uh, remember I spoke about the common greenhouse gases. These are some of them. And of course, they are chemical formula, but the global warming potential I spoke about so you discover the carbon dioxide basically is called one, which is a baseline, methane 30, nitrogen oxide 265, global warming potential. And you need this global warming potential when you're calculating the, 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 the emissions because they are all going to be converted to carbon dioxide equivalent, which is another term maybe that I did not include earlier on. So carbon dioxide equivalent is when we convert methane to the baseline of carbon dioxide. So it means a one ton of methane will give us about 30 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Nitrogen, one ton gives us 265. All those other chemicals, they will give us those figures that are included. For example, sulfur, uh, hexafluoride, it will give us 26,100 uh, tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. So these are very critical uh, factors, uh, global warming potentials, because when you now want to do the carbon trade, you're not going to trade as methane, nitrogen dioxide, ETC, oxide, ETC. You trade as, as a baseline of carbon dioxide equivalent. So then you have to convert this to, uh, to the equivalent of a ton of carbon dioxide. So we're saying that for methane, one ton will be equivalent to, it will be equivalent, one ton of methane will be equivalent to 30 tons of carbon dioxide uh, oxide. Uh, there are also uh, 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 what are called the economic sectors and what they emit. You discover that the, the largest sector is industry, which is coming with about 21%. Then uh, we, we have the, uh, the other sector that is interesting there, transport, uh, agriculture, electricity, production. And uh, by the way, look at the electricity and heat production. Actually, it's not industry. Industry is the second largest. The electricity and heat production is the first in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions, and that includes energy, 
industry transport buildings and uh, and, and 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 also part of uh, when you do the, the 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 energy the heating there so who is polluting more or who is polluting a lot you can see when it comes to the amount of greenhouse gases we are emitting as a continent this is just carbon there's some calculations done by the world resources institute there uh, i think it was in 2006 or so uh, they say africa were just emitting in terms of carbon dioxide not greenhouse gas emissions but carbon dioxide specifically about 2.5% and uh, you can see the, the other the other countries and continents and how big they become when you put them uh, in terms of their emissions. Of course, this of course a lot of debates in negotiations in terms of how we address the emissions. But for now, our our issue is even though as a continent we are emitting less, we need then not to be left behind in terms of the carbon market. We need to understand how it works, and we also need to be part of that uh, carbon market. Now, some of the climate change drivers that are of interest for us to note, we have got warming trends, we've got extreme temperature, we've got drying trends, we've got extreme pre precipitation, we've got damaging cyclones. I think uh, we cannot overemphasize on cyclones in 2019. We had cyclone Idai, cyclone Kenneth, we had others before, Dineo in Southern Africa. And, and, and this uh, is, is interesting. We have uh, also tornadoes that are uh, increasing over flooding, storm surges, ocean acidification, then of course, carbon dioxide, fertilize, carbon dioxide fertilization. All these are actually drivers uh, to climate change as presented by the IPCC ARA4, ARA5 report of 2014. Now, what was also interesting for us to note in terms of what then happens from these drivers and what changes are taking place. So from the ARA5 report, uh, in 2014, uh, we discovered that the average combined land and ocean surface temperature anomaly it is increasing, increasing significantly. We also discovered that the uh, global average sea level is changing, is rising. That is the graph B. We also discovered that globally average greenhouse gas concentrations are increasing, they are growing, uh, graph C. And lastly, we discovered that Global anthropogenic, this is human induced carbon dioxide emissions are also growing. You can see that. So these are part of the trends that we are observing. And now this is why we are then forced to introduce or engage with the carbon market as one of the only mechan of as one of the mechanisms in terms of addressing uh, our challenge of climate change. I'm saying it's one of because there are many other mechanisms apart from. Uh, carbon uh, uh, carbon trade uh, space that we can use. Then of course the changes in temperature and also predicted changes in rainfall. And what is happening there? The world by 2100 is a, a expected to be greatly warmer. You can as we are moving there from minus two, which is extremely cold, to about 11 degrees. You can see and you can relate to where Africa is and what is going to happen there. We also have changes in average precipitation, mm -hmm. where it's going to increase, where it's going to be less. And you can also relate on the continent. So these are some of the trends and drivers that we really need to be aware of uh, as we are talking about climate change, carbon markets, and also the climate markets. Now, there are also some regional issues there. I will just uh, uh, zero in to the African continent. So we are going to have compounded stress on water resources. Uh, we're also going to have reduced crop production and livelihood and food security, and lastly, vector and waterborne diseases. So one might then ask, so what, what is the carbon market to do with what I'm saying? It's simple. We are saying as we, as long as we continue emitting carbon, uh, carbon into the atmosphere as a continent and also as a world, these challenges are going to continue, uh, 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 they are going to, 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 to continue rising and it can be very difficult for us, especially because we are uh, more vulnerable we don't have the, uh, the the required technical capacity. We don't have the required financial stamina. All these issues are going to be challenges we'll face as a continent. Now, there are also some issues that are coming from, because we are talking about carbon markets, I'm narrowing down there to the IPCC report on mitigation of, of climate change, which came out in 2022. These are some of the key issues that have been raised. From 2010 to 2019, Average annual greenhouse gases emissions at 
uh, they have been at highest levels in human history. That's uh, that is worrying. We are not on track to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, although there is increased evidence of climate action, unless there are immediate and deep emission reductions across all sectors. 1.5 degrees is beyond our reach. In some cases, costs for renewable renewables have fallen below those of fossil fuels, and as such, even in the carbon markets and other climate uh, uh, markets, we need them to embrace that. Electricity systems in some countries and regions are already predominantly powered by renewables. When you discover there what is happening, uh, uh, remember saying we are not on track, that graph is just simply emphasizing that we are not track or we are not on track and what is happening to some of the major uh, 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 Kyoto Protocol gases uh, that we are talking about or we spoke about earlier on. That's what this graph is emphasizing on. Now, moving forward again, in the mitigation report, they said limiting warming to 1.5 degrees requires uh, global greenhouse gas emissions to peak uh, by 2025 and start reducing uh, by 43% by 2030. Methane reduced by 34% by 2030. So these are some of the trajectories or projections that are coming from the IPCC. They are saying limiting warming to around 2 degrees requires global greenhouse gas emissions to peak before 2025 reduced by 27% by 2030. And of course, the temperature will stabilize when we reach net zero carbon dioxide emissions or carbon neutrality. There are options available now in every sector that can at least have emissions by 2030. Now, these are some of the options that you might want to look at as you maybe go back to your government, your organizations to assist governments in Africa to say, what can we do? So I think these are the options available in the sectors energy, land use, industry, urban areas, buildings, transport, we can do something to have our emissions there by 2030, or at least to reduce those emissions in those key major uh, emitting centers. Now, major transitions are required to limit global warming. For example, there's need to for a reduction in fossil fuels use and use of carbon capture and storage. Now, this is quite interesting. With the war that is taking place in Russia and all the contests that is there, the European Union going back to using coal and maybe dusting there some of their nuclear power plants, then the question somebody might say, so what? What about us in Africa? Should we stop also using coal? I just want to rest, uh, assure you that from COP26 in 2021, an agreement was reached that we need to do what we call a coal drawdown. I might come back to this uh, later on, but we are saying it's almost like a soft landing to 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 call to to moving away from call, and of course the those in the European Union are saying this is actually a temporal measure because of the unforeseen war in Russia, so we have to actually have an intermediate intervention. That's why we are possibly going back to call and also other uh, fossil fuels based uh, 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 platforms for energy uh, generation. Widespread electrification improved energy efficiency is needed. Then alternative fuels, hydrogen and sustainable biofuels are needed. So what we discovered there is these are all potential areas for your carbon markets as you're going to be dealing with it. Then there's also the issue around uh, reducing demand and low carbon technologies are key to reducing emissions. Electric vehicles, therefore the greatest potential. Battery technology advances could assist electrical rail trucks in the aviation and shipping, there is also need for alternative fuels, low emissions, hydrogen and biofuels needed. Then overall, substantial potential, but depends. Overall, there is substantial potential, but all this depends on decarbonizing the power sector. Today we've got um, uh, our to-do issue there. You can do both. Uh, as the, uh, the first one is just looking at the Global Carbon Project, and the other one is looking at the Global Carbon Atlas. Uh, first one, we want you to visit uh, the above website and post any key discovery you make regarding carbon emissions and uh, COVID-19 on the platform. This is actually the IDEP platform. Then we also want on the second one to please visit the above website and navigate to determine how much carbon your country is emitting and put it as a percentage compared to either USA or China. So this is just some simple activities that can also bring you closer to what we are trying to achieve here. I'm going to move on to 
Section three, uh, this section is going to look at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Carbon Market. So what is interesting is like the, uh, remember I say, I'm not going to abbreviate it to UNFCCC because you are familiar. So the UNFCCC is one of the three conventions that was signed during the Rio summit in 1992. The other conventions uh, of similar stature include Convention on Violence for Biodiversity, Convention on Combating Desertification. The NFCCC has the main objective of addressing the greenhouse gas emissions and stabilizing their concentration in the atmosphere. The convention demands that countries publish inventories of sources and sinks of their greenhouse gas emissions. And for a while, this was done through the national communications done after every five years. Countries would also formulate and implement some mitigation plans. There was also a commitment at, uh, that countries share scientific information. All these are provisions that are being laid out in the UNFCCC. Now, uh, to implement the UNFCCC in terms of carbon reductions or greenhouse gas emissions reduction, an instrument or a subsidiary instrument called the Kyoto Protocol was put in place and uh, it also uh, uh, networks into the carbon market. That is chapter four, uh, section four that we are moving into now. So in terms of this section four, I, we want participants to watch all these three clips. They are short. Uh, first one, the history of the Kyoto Protocol, three minutes. The Kyoto Protocol to the UNFCCC, 14 minutes. And what is the Kyoto Pro Protocol, three minutes. You can watch in whatever order you want to watch. Now, the Kyoto Protocol uh, is an international agreement standing uh, on its own and requiring separate ratification by governments, but linked to the UNFCCC. So the Kyoto Protocol, some call it the KP, the Kyoto Protocol, among other things, sets binding targets for the reduction of greenhouse gases, gas emissions by industrialized countries. I think maybe the right terminology is it's, it's to it sets or it, it, it set these things in the past. And of course, we are saying the commitment period for the Kyoto Protocol has ended and other new mechanisms have, uh, have, have come in. What is important here is to say the Kyoto Protocol set binding targets for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And once it set those binding targets, it means then it had to set the mechanisms of how to achieve that. So that's the next one. What were the Kyoto Protocol mechanism? So they are... The, the three procedures or mechanisms were established under the Kyoto Protocol to increase the flexibility and reduce the cost of making greenhouse gas emission cuts. So these three mechanisms include what we call the Clean Development Mechanism, CDM, Emissions Trading, ET, and Joint Implementation. Don't worry about this, we're going to explain them later. The Kyoto Protocol was operationalized uh, um, uh, 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 by the UNFCCC as 37 industrialized countries in the EU were given a task to reduce their emissions by on average 5.2% below 1990 levels between 2008 and 2012, thereby creating the mandatory carbon market. So just in case you do not know where the carbon market came from and the mandatory one, it was actually institutionalized, it was mandatory, it was embedded in the Kyoto Protocol. So the, the manner in which the market was created was 5.2% of greenhouse gas emissions average based on 1990 uh, level was supposed to be reduced between 2008 and 2012. So remember those three mechanisms, they were supposed to be assisting in this. If you're looking at that carbon market that was created, uh, you uh, I'm coming from the 12 o'clock position on the figure. On the left there, there's a regulatory compliance market, and that compliance market is actually coming from the Kyoto Protocol, where the CDM, where the joint implementation, and also where there is uh, um, emissions trading. Then uh, you, you discover the other compliance markets there, European Union, and also the, the, the UK emission trading scheme, the Chicago Climate Exchange. Then also had voluntary markets, and of course, they got another, another route. We spoke about voluntary and compliance market earlier on. So what is interesting there, just a, a bit of a figure that came there. It's an odd figure, but it shows us the trends of how uh, the, the value of the carbon market rising from slightly below uh, 0.7 billion in 2004 
to as high as 144 billion in 2009. So the carbon market really uh, was there. And I think the major challenges you see in the presentations like, did we engage with it as Africa or as Africans? Now, Kyoto Protocol mechanisms and their assets. So by assets, we are saying, what type of carbon credits do they generate? So overall, you can say these mechanisms generate uh, carbon credits or carbon assets. So remember, talking about emissions trading, what it generates in terms of assets is what we call assigned amount units. Clean development mechanism, it generated carbon reduction units. Then, of, of course, it also generated emissions reduction units. So generic, we can just call this carbon assets. Now, what is the clean development mechanism? It is a mechanism under the Kyoto Protocol through which a developed country party may finance greenhouse gas emissions reduction or removal projects in a developing country and receive credits for doing so, which they may apply towards meeting mandatory limits on their own, for example, as said in the Kyoto Protocol, or if it is a company or mandatory unit is set by its government, its host government. So what is interesting here, I'm going to pause here to explain a bit because this is a critical mechanism because that's the only one of the three mechanism, the mechanisms in the Kyoto Protocol that applies to Africa. So we are saying here, the UK, the US or whatever country or a company in the US can come to say Senegal, then they say, you know, to, to, to a Senegalese uh, government or municipality or another entity. We see uh, the, your waste management is not done properly. We have got this green development mechanism under the Kyoto Protocol where we can convert your waste to energy. So when you are converting waste to energy by harnessing methane generated at a landfill site, we can calculate how much methane we have um, uh, harnessed, we have captured, that was supposed to be damaging the atmosphere and put it in the in terms of remember that uh, global warming potential in terms of carbon credits and the, then it it comes to tons now so that company can say this project we have instilled to convert uh, methane into energy generation is worth for argument's sake say 200 tons per year and maybe it can go uh, declining over the next uh, five to ten years then they say, okay, this project is going to get generate this amount of credits. Then remember those verifications we're talking about, a verifying party can come, yes, it's true. Then that particular company is now owning or it registers a Kyoto Protocol project with the registry in the URFCCC. Then it can say, uh, from my Senegal project, I have got 100,000 worth of credits. Then of course, you can see on the carbon markets, how much are the, the, the credits? if they want to sell them on an open market or they can keep them, then they can continue a meeting in their own country. So those are some of the arguments that are coming in terms of the uh, green development mechanism and the unfairness or fairness of their off. So one of the major advantages that was being highlighted for a developing country was, number one, you have a clean environment, you have jobs generated, you could also have electricity generated and those will be your benefits. Of course, there are a lot of debates around the fairness and that and I'm not going to get into that uh, in this uh, particular uh, recording or this course. I'm just trying to give you the background to the Kyoto Protocol and how the carbon market was established. Let us move on to the emissions trading, uh, which was the second mechanism or one of the three mechanisms under the Kyoto Protocol. So the only difference here is um, uh, uh, the, the emissions not the only difference. The emission trading is that one of the three Kyoto mechanisms by which an Annex One party may transfer Kyoto Protocol units to or acquire units from another Annex One party. So what they are saying that these are developed developed countries. So this is a trade between developed countries, and uh, that's why it is applied a lot in the European Union. The implementation is very similar to the clean development mechanisms, only that it was being applied with the um, uh, uh, developing East European countries. So it's it's very much similar to the clean development mechanisms. The only thing is there, it's a regional uh, con context, which was Eastern Europe. Now, emissions reduction unit, I spoke about that. Uh, Kyoto Protocol unit is equal to one metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent. And of course, that emissions reduction unit is generated for emissions reductions or emissions removal 
for projects that are being implemented and it can also allow trade of carbon. Um, one of the, I will not talk about the CDM help desk, you can do it on your own. I want to move to the Green Climate Fund. So the Green Climate Fund is quite an interesting uh, uh, issue there. It came during the transition from the Kyoto Protocol to the Paris Agreement. It was established in, it was actually established in 2009 in Copenhagen. And of course, in, in Cancun, in Mexico, it uh, COP16, it was solidified. And of course, the Green Climate Fund will support projects, programs, policies, and other activities in developed countries, uh, parties. And don't worry about the Green Climate Fund. We are going to come back uh, and dwell on it in, in further depth when we do module on climate financing. Then uh, there was also things about the clean development loan schemes and certified emissions reduction units. You can read this on your own. What I want to move on to now is to say under the Kyoto Protocol, uh, remember I was talking about how the trade would take, takes place. One ton of carbon dioxide equivalent, is, we, we denoted it an E. Here we have abbreviated the CO2E. It is equivalent to one, one credit unit. So uh, now this is actually the, the, the what in mathematics, a common denominator. So remember all those uh, greenhouse gases we're talking about, methane, carbon dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, oxide, they are now put into a common denominator, which is a ton, uh, a, a ton of carbon dioxide equivalent. Then reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the developing world uh, was cheaper. And since that was cheaper, uh, then it was, it, it was estimated then when the Kyoto Protocol mechanism was being put in place to say, uh, uh, um, uh, one to four time, one to four US dollars would be required to reduce a ton of carbon dioxide compared to about 15 tons in a developed world. So this is where we discovered that a lot of uh, emission reduction uh, projects, some of them then were diverted to developing countries because it was simply cheaper to do that. The Kyoto Protocol also uh, stipulates four typologies of potential carbon commodities, and these include assigned amount units, emission reduction units, certified emission reductions, and removal units. So basically, these are just uh, depending on the mechanism or depending on those three mechanisms, which one are you using, like I explained earlier on. Now, all the above uh, carbon commodities can be referred for policy purposes as carbon credits or carbon offsets. So I think this is also one of the terminologies that you need to be familiar with. And of course, uh, the first three are usually achieved by reducing emissions at source, or through increasing the rate of absorbance from the atmosphere into carbon sinks. Of course, carbon credits or carbon offsets can be earned by investing by any investing country or company from other, uh, among others. So the, the, when we, the investments under the Kyoto Protocol being done, there were common sectors that attracted these investments or projects for carbon offsetting or carbon credits. They included energy, industrial processes, agriculture and waste. You can actually go back to that slide that was talking about the sources of emissions and you see why the energy sector was preferred in industry. Remember that was about 25% and also 20-21% uh, uh, if my memory serves me well on that graph. After the first commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol, which ended in 2012, parties to the protocol met in Doha, Qatar, to discuss an amendment to the original Kyoto Protocol Agreement. The Doha Amendment added new targets for the, um, it added new targets for the second commitment period, which was 2020, 2012 to 2020. And that second commitment period uh, to reduce emissions by at least 18% below uh, uh, 1990. So what was happening there? Uh, remember the first commitment period was 2008 to 2012. Then, of course, as this was approaching, there were discussions, deliberations, say, what do we do with the uh, commitment phases of the Kyoto Protocol that was ending? So, so a, a tentative arrangement was there to say, let's have another commitment period, 2012 to 2020, and we have got about, we need about 18% of our greenhouse gas emissions globally below 20, 1990 to be reduced. However, this was short-lived, as in 2015, the Paris Climate Agreement came into effect. So, uh, so uh, as uh, during that transition period, the idea originally was, let's have a second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol. 
Then when they that failed, uh, or maybe when that was oh, not failed, when that was overtaken by the Paris Agreement, then it was actually a hazy affair. You no, know, it, it a gray area emerged there. So we we'll see almost like the death of the second commitment period of the Kyoto Pro Protocol and also the emergence of the Paris Agreement. So what is quite interesting there, which is fundamental for us as Africans to understand is when we used to have the Kyoto Protocol and the UNFCCC, we would have what we call the two-track system and everything. So because the one track was for the industrial countries that were given commitments, the other track was everybody, <clears throat> including the industrialized nations that would negotiate under the UNFCCC. So when the Paris Agreement came, it's now almost like a single track. There's nothing like there's a Paris Agreement for industrialized countries and a Paris Agreement for developing countries. The Paris Agreement is for all the countries, so everybody is now in the same port. Uh, good or bad, I would say for Africa, that decision was quite a bad one because now even enforcing or giving the mandatory uh, commitments to developed countries is difficult. Everybody now else is working under the nationally determined the contributions. Now, some of the carbon market growth, I think I pointed out earlier on in terms of what has happened. I'll skip this slide because I'm, there's a similar graph we had earlier on. I want to move to second point, which deals with the uh, greenhouse gas protocol and the emission scope. Now, this is critical because the greenhouse gas protocol and other ISO standards um, your pass in terms of when you're dealing with the greenhouse gas emissions, which greenhouse gas emissions are we dealing with? What scopes are we talking about? We have got an activity there. You can watch scope of greenhouse gas emissions, explain five minutes. You can also look at the greenhouse gas, greenhouse gas protocol part three, looking at the scope three categories explained. You can also look at what is scope one, two, three, greenhouse gas accounting, which is interesting, six minutes, only six minutes. So we are uh, deliberate when we picking this activity so that it is not like a one day issue of you. So in about uh, less than 16 minutes uh, or so, you 20 minutes or so, you'll be have, uh, having a quick understanding of what that uh, entails. Now, the greenhouse uh, gas protocol, GHG, as it is abbreviated, is the global standard for companies and organizations to measure and manage their greenhouse gas emissions and become more efficient, resilient, and prosperous. So now, what is important here is like, much of the production globally is by, by, by companies. Of course, the governments are involved in also production, but much of the activities are by companies. So if you're going to pinpoint who is emitting, it's basically the companies. Then the companies, if they're told who is emitting, they'll say it's the consumer who causes us to emit. But then the carbon market is also trying to address the okay, less than put a system that can encourage us to be active citizens in reducing our carbon emissions. So the GHG protocol was jointly developed by the World Resources Institute and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development with the first edition published in 2001. So there are other editions that have come in there. And of course, the GHG protocol um, uh, 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 corporate standard classifies a company's greenhouse gas emissions into three scopes. Uh, so its scopes is basically nature. We have a scope one, scope two, and scope three. Now, what do you mean by scope one, scope two, and scope three? This this slide basically um, helps us to understand that. Let's start by scope one. So in scope one, we're saying it covers what we call direct emissions that come from sources that are owned or controlled by a company, such as on-site manufacturing and industrial processes, computers and data centers, on-site transportation, that whatever greenhouse gas emissions coming from those sources, they're called scope one. Scope two, it covers what we call indirect emissions. And these indirect emissions include those, uh, the purchased uh, or acquired energy consumed by the company. It also can include things like, uh, uh, we have um, the purchased electricity, steam heating and cooling emissions depends on source of electricity. Then scope three, it includes all other indirect emissions that occur in a company's value chain, including supply chain operations, and of course, end product usage by uh, consumers. Things like empl employees commuting or business travel, purchased goods and services, and use of sold products. All these come under scope three. And of course, there is, a, a, in your notes there, or PowerPoint, you see the 
the diagram that is explaining all those scopes. So these are actually uh, the scopes of emissions. When I talk about, we want to talk about carbon uh, markets. We can then not pass through the scope of emissions. Scope one direct, uh, scope two indirect, and scope three at times we call them fugitive emissions. Now, scope one emissions. Uh, what is it all about? The release of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere from sources such as buildings and operation directly owned by controlled by an organization. For example, if a company owns a fleet of trucks, the greenhouse gases emitted by these trucks would count towards the carbon scope and emission. Scope two, I, I think I spoke about that. And then uh, scope three, I'm not going to repeat what I've explained. So the figure, you can see the diagram, then you can see further explanations in the slides that follow. Now, I've put a note there to say all the emissions can be reduced to a single value, which is carbon dioxide equivalent through carbon footprinting activities that utilize the global warming potentials. GWPs are global warming potentials of different greenhouse gas. I've already spoken about that. And of course, the carbon footprint value can also be linked to carbon credit and end. Now, let's move on to uh, section six that is looking at challenges associated with the Kyoto Protocol CDM. Now, you will discover in the literature, the question that has been there is like, why is it that we, as, as a continent, especially as African continent, and many other developing countries did not engage actively with the clean development mechanisms as provided by the Kyoto Protocol? Now, you can actually look at that activity on the success of the Kyoto Protocol and the criticisms, 18 minutes, that's up to you. So what you discover there, uh, we, we, we are just trying to uh, project here, CDM projects, lifespan and jobs uh, potential. So these were some of the things that was saying, if, if uh, uh, you, you put a project, uh, a CDM project in transport, and it was an average life of uh, 16.3, uh, what, what then can uh, become of it? Then you also see one of the major issues, remember we're talking about the challenges. What really emerged was Africa really, Took, took about just 5%. We're talking about the potential for global carbon market there. Africa had just about 5%. And look at China and the rest of Asia. So if you talk China and the rest of Asia, they are actually having over uh, almost like 80% of the clean development uh, 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 global market uh, potential and specifically the clean, uh, clean development mechanism market. So the, the, the challenge thing that came was that uh, Africa did not engage early enough with the clean development uh, mechanism or CDM project, like what is happening there. In about 2005, there were about 264 projects that were registered, North and Middle East Africa, four, sub saharan Africa, five. So we can simply say both North Africa, Middle East and Africa, or Africa and the Middle East, only had nine projects out of 264 projects. Where were the major projects? It was Asia Pacific and Latin America. So really, it, this became a problem in terms of, of engagement. The investment there, you see UK investing a lot in that, the Clean Development Mechanism Protocol. Then for projects in South Africa, those that were there. So South Africa was one of the countries that, was, uh, that, that tried to engage with the CDM project. And I think, uh, apart from South Africa, I don't know of any other African countries that seriously engage with the CDM uh, project. Now, what was actually challenging with this was Africa was slow to check up the Clean Development Mechanism Project facility, um, encouraging investment in these projects and other issues. And by the time we thought of engaging in the CDM project around 2012, 2011, where we can see in the graph a peaking there, the price is globally yet fallen drastically. So if you're going to plot the price of carbon there, you'd see a sharp decline. It almost went to zero dollars per ton at some point uh, during that particular phase, maybe dropped as, as, as low as two, two euro or two dollars. Uh, per ton. And this is the time when the CDM projects were picking in on the African continent. And as such, then those CDM projects did not generate the uh, adequate revenue and even development trajectories that was needed. All those issues that were happening, for example, Africa accounted for less than 10% of CDM projects in developing countries, and we are now looking at uh, uh, 2021. So this, the, the data that we have now, when you look at Africa, excluding North Africa, you can just see just, just small portion 
of CDM projects. Now, when you look at actually 2021, there isn't actually no CDM project being recorded for, for, for Middle East and also even North Africa. Uh, for that matter, so you discover that all the all the um the 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 the, the CDM projects they did not really get traction on the African continent, and the reason why that happened is we engaged so late with the CDM mechanism, and the reason why this course also is being put in place. Let's say we since we are preparing now to to the. Uh, article Article Six uh, Carbon Markets of the Paris Agreement. We are also going to Egypt uh, just in two months' time. We are saying we need to be having at the back of our mind that if we are going to engage with the carbon market, the carbon markets, climate and carbon market, we need then to be upfront. We need then to put our readiness pillars in place. We need to have our technical capacity up, up, up and running so that by the time all these things are being deliberated and maybe the, the rule books and the protocols are, are finalized, then we are ready as a continent. Now, let's move on to section seven. Section seven is talking, talking about voluntary compliance market, carbon markets. Now, the, uh, we, we also looked at the uh, uh, videos, short clips. What are voluntary carbon markets and how do they work? You can view that seven minutes. Voluntary carbon market explained, uh, six minutes. Voluntary carbon market participants, who does what? six minutes all this will enhance your understanding of the voluntary carbon markets before even you go further to read your notes and also listen to this so basically a voluntary carbon market is a carbon market in which members are not legally compelled to reduce their emissions but to do so voluntarily these markets enable carbon emitters to offset their emissions by acquiring carbon credits generated by third party uh, initiatives aimed at removing or decreasing greenhouse gas emissions from the environment. So companies can engage in a voluntary carbon market on their own or as part of an industry-wide program. Now, here's the challenge. The, the challenge of voluntary carbon markets, a company can come, go to any country in, Af in Africa, uh, having its own arrangement, and government might not even be knowing what is happening. So I think that as we're going to be talking about this uh, new carbon market in light from the Paris Agreement, we also need to understand how this voluntary carbon market work can, and how it can also be brought into the mainstream. So I think that uh, as African governments, let's be aware, because by the end of the day, you might discover a whole Congo basin or uh, part of the Congo basin forest is mortgaged under a voluntary carbon market, and the government is not getting any benefit from that, even so the local communities. And more so to say what then happens in the future, if, for example, we allow say, for example, in haphazard development of this voluntary carbon market uh, on our continents. So all these things are part of what we call um, our readiness in terms of preparing for the for the for, for Article 6 of the uh, Paris Agreement. And also when I'm talking about the voluntary carbon market, there are some of the global institutions that we cannot leave out. One of them is what we call the gold standard verified carbon standard, which is a non-governmental emissions reduction project certification scheme. It participates in the clean development mechanism, the voluntary carbon market, and many climate and development in initiatives. It's also going to participate in the Article 6. So I think this uh, entity then is the one almost that says, okay, whatever is being claimed by an entity that is in invested in the voluntary carbon market is true. We also have got VERA, which is also a certification standard for non-governmental emission reduction initiatives, similar to the gold standard, and it participates participated also in the clean development mechanism, voluntary carbon market, and many other development initiatives. So this also is quite uh, important in terms of when you move to the uh, voluntary carbon market. I am going to stop here. Uh, in terms of my recording, we have come to the end of module one, and I hope uh, you have got, gotten some insights in terms of what we intended to, to, to bring to you uh, as an introductory a, a, a module with the history uh, of the uh, Kyoto Protocol and the Clean Development Mechanism, also emphasizing that there are matters we need to highlight, things like do we understand the uh, uh, carbon dioxide equivalent uh, 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 notation and how it brings a trade in carbon uh, in in global in the global carbon markets, 
things like do we understand the greenhouse gas scope uh, of emissions, scope one, uh, uh, direct, scope two, indirect, scope three, emissions, uh, fugitive uh, emissions. Do we understand that? We also spoke about the compliance markets generated by the UNFCCC under the Kyoto Protocol. And we also spoke about the three Kyoto Protocol mechanism, market-based mechanisms, which is actually uh, CDM, Clean Development Mechanisms, Joint Implementation, and also Emissions Trading. Then we ended up actually uh, touching base with the, what we call the volatile carbon markets. And one of the major issues we were raising was, why was it that the African continent was left behind in the CDM, uh, maybe possibly apart from South Africa? And we said it was the late, late engagement and possibly the lack of understanding of what has taken, taken place. And we need to avoid this as we go uh, 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 into a serious implementation of the Paris Agreement. And even uh, if you're a negotiator, as you're going to negotiations in terms of putting the rule books, the protocols and other things that will be needed to actually uh, 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 make uh, Article 6 effective. Thank you so much uh, for your uh, following and also uh, I hope you have enjoyed uh, my sharing. Thank you.